Thank you so much, uh, Excellencies. It's a huge pleasure for me to be here. A great pleasure for me to follow um, my dear friend Jeff Sachs, um, whom I agree with on, on almost all things, as, as I do on what he just said. Let me actually expand on what he was talking about uh, and talk about how it feels, it seems to me that broadband has the potential to really solve two very dramatic problems that, uh, that are going to uh, confront the, the world of education. The first is simply of scale, of being able to provide enough education to enough people around the world. Uh, if you look at the number of people who are moving into uh, the age cohort that requires some kind of post uh, uh, high school training of some kind, uh, the numbers are just staggering. And with the one exception of China, there is no country that has really even remotely begun to address what it would take in terms of the expansion of physical capacity to educate these people. And even China is struggling with, despite the fact that it is essentially starting a university a week, um, really pro probably closer to a university a month, um, the problem of human capital. How do you train those many teachers to create that kind of access? The only solution to it, it seems to me, is to really fully embrace the, uh, the online revolution and recognize how it is going to be able to provide that kind of education. So I gave the example in my talk yesterday of Bob Schiller, uh, a famous economist just like Jeff Sachs, who told me that last year in his, uh, it was the first year he offered an online course. Uh, and in that course, the number of people who took the course, took it, completed it, did all their tests, received a diploma, was larger than the number of people he has ever taught in 32 years of teaching at Yale. Uh, and that is, by the way, a tough course, right? There, there are a number of courses that uh, I think the numbers would be even higher for that. The quality level can be seen in this. The, the founder of Coursera, Andrew Ng, is a computer science professor at Stanford. He pointed out that last year, um, I think something like uh, 40,000 people took his course all over the world. The top 500 spots, not one of them was held by a Stanford undergraduate who was physically in his course. In other words, all the top 500 students were somewhere out there online, not at Stanford. Um, and so you see in that the capacity for the expansion, the capacity to tap and cultivate human talent and intelligence all over the world. Um, but there is another enormous advantage to this. Historically, we have always thought of scale and quality as being inversely correlated in education. That is, the best education was private one-on-one -on -one tutorial that uh, you know, the rich provided to their children. The next best thing would be schools where you have one, t one teacher and maybe eight students. And you know, big public uh, state-funded schools would have maybe one, one teacher and 50, 60 students, maybe a class with 300 students. And that was seen as worse and worse and worse. What technology is doing is it is, it is making it possible to imagine that scale and quality can now be positively correlated rather than inversely correlated. Why? Because the data that you receive from the fact that tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are taking these courses will allow you to reshape the courses in a way that actually customizes the course for each individual taking the course. So imagine I'm taking a mathematics course, I take my first quiz, I get the fourth question wrong. Because one million people have taken the same course online, you, now, you know that if the person got the fourth question wrong, it means they didn't understand lecture two, part three. And the computer sends you back and says, can you watch this module again and now take this, quest this quiz again? And so on. And so what you end up with the course I am taking is completely different from the course my neighbor is taking and is completely different from the one you're taking. You end up with a highly customized experience, far more customized and personalized than it would be if you were simply sitting in a large class even at Stanford or at Harvard listening to, to uh, one, one professor 
And, and so what you are now providing is a better, more customized, higher quality education than you could receive even at the best Ivy League uh, university. That is the promise of big data, and that is the promise of big data when applied to this kind of uh, educational system. Um, I think you can imagine how this, the, you know, the, the opportunities here. The, 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 this online uh, courses and MOOCs, I think, got ahead of themselves a little. People began to imagine that they were going to transform the world, and then people started noticing that a very small number of the people who, uh, who started the courses completed, which is very misleading because this is a product on the internet, open and free to anyone, um, requiring of nothing. So for example, a, 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 a course that Jeff Sachs teaches at Columbia can only be taken in the physical capacity by people who have already been gone through an enormous screening hurdle, which is called the Columbia application process. And it is only those people who can even at attend the, uh, the lecture. And by the way, even once they do, there is a large drop-off from the first lecture to, say, the people taking the course. Probably not in the case of Jess Sachs, because he's a very good lecturer. But for many people, there is a sh so-called shopping period. And you know, you end up with 40% of the people. Here you have the world's shopping period, as it were, of complete people who are coming in from God knows where with no qualifications. If you end up with a 5% completion rate, which is what they're finding, that is still tremendous. And given that you're starting with numbers sometimes in the hundreds of thousands, this is still an enormous expansion. But it now gets me to my second point, which is the, the, the really innovative element of online education, I think, is going to be in the way in which it completely unbundles and re reorients the way we think about education. By which I mean, we tend to think of education as something that is provided by an educational institution to a group of people who have been accredited, uh, and you know that is how it goes. But let's look at what is happening in the real world online. What is increasingly happening is that people are providing their skills, their talents as teachers, uh, and uploading them, as, as it were, onto the internet. And people are watching, listening, learning to those skills. Uh, I'm thinking of YouTube videos. I'm thinking of uh, all kinds of uh, websites like How Stuff Works. I'm thinking of a new uh, education company that actually acts as a eBay that provides a platform, a software platform, between instructors and students, and has now 20 million students, I believe. But when I say instructors, it's important to understand what I mean. I, I mean anyone who thinks he or she is an instructor in any subject he or she thinks they have a talent in. And so you can imagine a lot of them are computer coding and things like that. A lot of them are actually wellness and health related. A lot of them are how to appreciate music, how to read a poem. Um, all these things are being uploaded onto the internet and people are learning. What I think this addresses is a second great gap that education faces, which is the lifelong learning challenge. We are moving into a world in which you can train somebody for a job, but is that job going to be around five years from now? Is that company going to be around? Is that industry going to be around? We don't know. Um, I give you an example. There are currently jobs, uh, very good jobs that people have for online marketing on Twitter. There, this is actually a job that you can, you can train for. Will it exist five years from now? I don't know. Will Twitter exist five years from now? Will that job be actually online marketing on Snapchat? Right? So this kind of bottom-up uh, distributed education can respond much more quickly to the challenges and demands of the market than Harvard, Yale, or Princeton, or Columbia can. Um, and it is... It's not education in the sense of learning ancient Greek and Latin, but it does fill a very important need that people are going to have to upgrade their skills, to upgrade their knowledge, and by the way, to continue a process of lifelong learning and enrichment. That's where the poems and, and, and music come in. But this, I think, is something we've only just begin to, begun to scratch the surface of, and I think it has also the, 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 the possibility of 
tapping human talent in a completely different way than people uh, have done. There's a, there was a wonderful book called Abundance by, by a um, writer, Peter Diamandopoulos, and he talks about this, uh, the promise of crowdsourcing and online ed education in this way. There, there was, for a long time, people have tried to figure out who are good at a very technical task of folding proteins, folding protein mole molecules. It's a very difficult thing, mostly done by graduate students at biochemistry labs. They decided, why don't we open it up, give people some instructions of what you need to do, and just see if there are other good protein folders out there in the world. And they held a contest. And it turned out that the world's best protein folder was a, a grade school teacher in England who did this at nights for fun. And she literally was better than any graduate student in biochemistry and any you know, of the storied universities in the world. What that talk, I think what that touches on is the, the extraordinary opportunity we have here to tap into human talent. Everybody is, a, is an expert at one thing, uh, probably. And if that one thing uh, is, is of some value and can be communicated and can be articulated, it can be taught and people can learn from it. And you know, what, a, what, a, what a fascinating idea for the world that we all have the capacity to teach something, we all have the capacity to learn from someone, uh, and that that can produce uh, all, you know, all, all kinds of things. By the way, this one company that does it, that does this platform I was describing, I can't remember the name of it, the, the CEO is, is here. Um, well, he was telling me that the top 10 teachers uh, instructors, again, self-appointed, self, -appointed, self uh, now personally make collectively $30 million a year. So when you think about the job potential, the, the economic activity that you can generate by being able to produce these kind of matchups, it feels to me that is the kind of promise that online uh, has. My final point to you is to look at where it could make a huge impact and how it will make a difference. I was in India two weeks ago, and I think what is happening in India is one of the great revolutions uh, that is taking place in the world right now. India has very bad broadband access. For those of you who've been, you know why. India has very bad infrastructure of every kind. Broadband is no different. Anything that requires you know, permissions and digging holes and, uh, you know, d dealing with all the, uh, the, the difficulties that that involves in a messy developing democracy, uh, India tends to do badly at. Um, and so it has bad broadband in infrastructure. I would guess, honestly, India has maybe 150 million people who have access to broadband internet, um, big cities, upper middle class people. What is happening in India is a 4G rollout that is the largest 4G rollout in the world. Um, you have four big companies led by Reliance, the largest company in, in, in India, uh, doing it on a massive scale. Reliance alone is building 150,000 cell phone towers. By 2018, they've already built 90,000. Uh, Bharti will do another, will probably match it. The net result is 800 million people will have 4G access in India by 2018. Uh, 1.1 1, 1, or 1.2 billion by by uh, 2020, uh, and the numbers right now are pretty. Uh, they're online. They're they're on track to achieve this. The 4G is better than 4G in the United States because they leapfrog. It's very good, high quality video, and so all of a sudden you're going to have a population twice the size of Europe that has access to high quality internet, uh, and I don't think we really know what the impact of that will be. Uh, it's a different you know, country than, obviously, it's a much poorer society, uh, country than even China. But it is also a country very plugged into the world because of uh, language. You know, about 300 million Indians have some working knowledge of English. Uh, it has asked, it has a, it's a much more open system. You know, and that's why Google and Facebook and Amazon will be, the, 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 there is no great firewall that the Indian government maintains that, that, uh, that blocks out um, foreign sites, foreign servers. And so all of that suggests that you're going to have something very, very interesting happen in India over the next five to ten years. And I think it would be fascinating uh, to see whether these, uh, you know, whether this promise uh, ends up being, being seen most fully in one of the poorest countries in the world. Thank you all.
Thank you for uh, sharing those uh, interesting perspectives with the, the members of the broadband commissions. Maybe just uh, uh, two comments. I mean, your perspective about scale and, and quality and, and the promise of, of technology to actually reverse the relationship between scale and quality and, and to provide uh, personalized learning on, on a large scale, which is uh, indeed, you know, quite a, a new, I would say, uh, world for, for, for education. Uh, also, what you said about, uh, you know, the possibility to actually identify uh, value uh, and share human talent, which I think is a very also humanistic uh, perspective, which I think is, is, uh, is very much also in line with the, the ideas and that the Broadband Commission is, is promoting also through access to, to broadband. So I think we have a, a few, maybe 10 minutes for uh, some, some questions. So I will invite uh, commissioners to take the floor for some further exchange with, uh, uh, with our uh, invitee, Farid uh, Zakaria. Professor Sack, you have, I see your play is on. I just want to say, I want to say bravo, and uh, of, of course, uh, Fareed uh, captured it perfectly. It also suggests that India may be the greatest transformation ground uh, because the Indian government will see that with this 4G rollout, it also has the opportunity to finish up the work that it started with the Arthar and with the other systems for the massive, scaled, complete transformation. And of course, it's got the, the talent inside to do it. So we may be witnessing the most dramatic transformation of a society to online that is imaginable. Thank you. We have Matt uh, Granules. Yes, thank you. Very impressive speech. Um, um, my, my, questions is, my question is really around um, vocational training and digital inclusion. When we talk about people becoming or going online and uh, creating good stuff, uh, you know, India is a great example. I'm pretty sure that not everyone is as fluent as we think they are on handling a mobile phone or, or being part of this new digital society. I'm pretty sure that several people, several hundreds of millions of people are sort of less apt in being a software developer or working you know, with, with, uh, with their intellect. However, with hands, they would possibly be more interested in working with some sort of manual labor. So the question is, do you think that vocational training will also have a, a, a future when it comes to, to uh, online training? And if so, how would that look? It's a very good question um, because in the world of bits and bytes, you, you, can, you can teach anything online. In a world that inter interacts with atoms as well, you need some physical instruction. Um, I think what's going to happen is there will be hybrid models. Uh, you are beginning to see that happen already where people do some of the learning online and then they, they, they do some part of it uh, in, in, in the real world. Uh, you know, there are places where you can go where you have, uh, you have kind of achieved a certain capacity or competence. Uh, you've watched the videos as it were, you know, let's say it's plumbing, and then you, you actually get a chance to, to complete the process in the physical world. Um, I, but I, I think that the, the potential probably is more limited there, let's be honest. Um, you know, but one thing I worry about is that there are going to be fewer of those jobs in the future than we think. I'll tell you, going to India, one of the things I was struck by, I, I think I mentioned this uh, yesterday. Um, I was talking, I'll say it here because it's a, pri it's a, it's a private conversation. Um, I was talking to Mukesh Ambani, uh, the head of Reliance, India's largest company, and he was talking about his worries about manufacturing. You know, everyone has this hope that manufacturing is going to be the next, the next path for development. And he said, I look at all the people I know building factories in India, and in every case, they're building factories that have 10 times the output, 100 times the output of the original factory with 10% of the labor. And the reason is you cannot achieve global specifications and quality without massive automa uh, automation and robotics. So we need to start thinking about, I mean, it may be that China will prove to be the last country 
to have industrialized in that classic model that we know, which is urbanization, the peasants move to the cities, the cities have big factories, they work at these big factories, generate a lot of pollution, and then we generate enough wealth to clean up the pollution. Maybe we're going to need a, a different model, which is more disaggregated, where people don't leave the villages, they don't, they, they, there are jobs in some way created there, and that those jobs are um, partly post-industrial, not entirely, but part, you know, there, there is, um, there, there is some greater component there that is that has a post-industrial quality to it, but the, the, you know the market is very good at being able to produce these kind of hybrid models that we were talking about. Um, I just think that um, we're probably in for a more complicated phase of development than people realize. I'll give you one statistic that you can see: India and China and India and Africa have both been growing pretty well for the last decade. Manufacturing as a percentage of GDP in both India and Africa has actually declined over the last 10 years. So even though 7 plus percent growth, manufacturing as a percentage of GDP has declined. It's never happened before in a developing economy. Uh, Professor Morenzi, for the last uh, question. Uh, uh, thank you. First of all, um, I'm, I'm excited in the my wife and I are very great fan of yours, so <laughs> when she knows that I, I spoke to you, she'll be very happy. So the, the, the issue of, uh, earlier today we, we discussed the issue of uh, uh, ICT in, in the achievement or implementing the sustainable development goals. Uh, you, you just spoke about the issue of, of education and you expanded it. Uh, you know. So can you say a few words about sustainable development and ICT? I, I don't think I have, I have more to add on something like that than somebody like Jeff Sachs. It, it seems to me that, um, you know, for, this is one of those cases where the world needs to, um, to credit itself for having achieved a fair amount in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, I think that if, when people, if you look back to those goals, uh, the Millennium Goal goals, when they were set out, very few people thought they would be achieved. Um, you know, sus the sustainable development uh, aspect adds a new, difficult, and demanding challenge, which is how do you how do you do it in a way that is truly sustainable? Uh, it, it seems to me we need a technological miracle, but I believe that there are technological miracles underway. There is simply no way you are going to achieve true sustainable growth without energy that has essentially zero carbon emissions and is cheaper than coal. Uh, if, it's not, if it doesn't have zero carbon emissions, it doesn't help with climate, on the climate change front. And if it isn't cheaper than coal, India and China will not do it. But the good news is I think you are getting several uh, possibilities on that front. Um, you have had a dramatic uh, transformation of solar. You're having a smaller but significant change in wind. Um, you are seeing battery technology improve really for the first time in, in, in a, uh, at a quantum level. Um, none of it has quite come together yet in, 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 to achieve the goal I was suggesting, which is zero emissions and, uh, and cheaper than coal. But that has got to be the goal. And I, really, I think that the big missing piece here, and again, I defer to, to Jeff who knows a lot more about this than I do, but the big missing piece here is if we think this is really important and we believe that technolo technology is going to be the solution, I don't think we are investing nearly as much in the technology, in the research, and even in the initial imp uh, implementation. If you look at the kind of investment that the United States government made in the computer business, in the 1950s and early 60s. Um, it dwarfs in scale what is being done now with clean energy. 65% of all silicon chips produced in the 1950s were bought by the US Air Force. Um, basically, the computer, the entire computer industry was funded by the Defense Department and, and then later NASA. Um, that was done for Cold War reasons, but I think we need some similar energy behind the idea of clean energy uh, and, and, a, and a sense of the magnitude of the issues. And 
I, I cannot recall a time when massive expenditures of, of, in research and technology and early Im implementation have gone awry. We have this myth that it's all, you know, the, the government shouldn't pick winners and losers, that it all goes badly. Give you one simple example. The government made an investment in Solyndra, this solar company, which went bad, and everybody heard about it. It was about $500 million, as I recall. The, the, the U.S. government at the same time made an equivalent investment, same thing, in Tesla, Elon Musk's car, uh, car company. That has, you know, just if you look at the market value of that, it's gone up 25, 30 times. Of course, the peculiar way we fund these things, when they go badly, the taxpayer pays, and when it goes well, Mr. Musk becomes a billionaire. So we, 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 we socialize the loss, but we privatize the gain. But it doesn't change the fundamental fact, which is that the same government, the same, you know, that, that, that picked a loser in Solyndra, picked a winner in Tesla. And of course, any venture capitalist would tell you, um, you have nine failures and you have one success and you're, you're a successful company. So I think we need, that is the fundamental gap I see. We need a much, much larger investment uh, with a goal set out clearly, uh, with resources to achieve it, and then things happen. Uh, and, you know, I know people sometimes say you can't throw money at a problem. Well, in research and technology, actually, you throw enough money at problems and, you know, magic does happen.